uh, hi everyone, and welcome to our uh, our October coffee chat. Uh, it's lovely to see so many of you here, both new faces and some usual suspects. Uh, so my name is Marie Rustan, and I'm the marketing director and product manager of Iris BG. Eivind Rustan, who's the founder and CEO of Iris BG, is also here today. So on today's agenda, uh, we'll start off with a short introduction by myself. And today we are so very lucky to have two mem members from our community that will share their experiences using custom attributes. Uh, the community challenge is brought to you by Jamie Fry, the assistant curator of living collections at Newfields. And then Alison Crook, the national curator of plants collections at Natru Nas National Trust UK will add another perspective and speak about how they use life, ut utilize custom attributes for their collection. So if you come to think about any questions for Jamie, Alison or me while we're speaking, you're welcome to add them to the chat, starting with the capital, capital Q, and we will address them uh, at the last point in, in our agenda, the so-called open chat. And of course, if time permits, we will also um, have a chat about other issues in the open chat session later. Um, uh, so just a short recap uh, for you that have attended this before, you've heard this before, but uh, I just want to say some few words about the coffee chats. Uh, the idea of this format is that we would like to offer an arena where you can connect with peers and have a chat about RSPG and your daily work with your collection. Uh, these sessions won't have a fixed format and you as a community can influence how they will evolve. So please let us know what you're interested in, if you would like to present the challenge or if you have any suggestions for improvement. So hopefully you will make some new connections and together we might become a bit wiser. Uh, so to get an idea of who's here today, I have the same poll as always. So the first question is related to your experience uh, with RSPG. Uh, and then the other one is whether you heard about uh, the custom attributes or not. As you can see here, uh, we have many of you that already use the custom attributes a lot, which is fantastic because then you can probably offer Jamie some, uh, some nice insights uh, afterwards and help the other ones out. I can also see that we are mixed with some novice people and some that are advanced and yeah, 45% uh, are actually intermediate today. So that's also fun to see a big, big range. So uh, why custom attributes? Uh, then many of you already know why this is smart and Jamie will also get into that later. But uh, there are mainly two reasons why we wanted to do this uh, topic today. And so what I hear being repeated so many places uh, is that time and resources are the major overarching challenges when work working on your plant records. And as you know, there are several ways in RSPG that can aid you with efficient collection management. So for instance, you can use tasks in your workflows. Uh, you can allow more staff or even volunteers to update your records. Uh, but today we will look at the possibility to define your own fields to correspond with your collection's particular scope. So the first reason is that the, the attributes can be great when you want to work more efficient with your collection data. The, the second and the most important reason is, of course, that Jamie just uh, put them to use and she wants to hear how the rest of the community is working with this. So without further ado, uh, Jamie, the, the mic is yours. Okay, awesome. So I am just going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and so today I am just going to do a quick sort of introduction of who I am and where I work. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how we're using custom attributes. Um, I'll hand it over to Allison and then I can't wait to hear what y'all are doing. Um, so Let's see, I am Jamie Fry. I am the assistant curator of Living Collections at Newfields, which is in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, so we are a 150 acre cultural campus just north of the city of Indianapolis. 
Um, that includes a 100 acre art and nature park that's largely focused on large scale art and native plants, uh, a 26 acre estate, uh, and about 26 acres of um, contemporary gardens around our museum. So we have a four story encyclopedic art museum. Um, like I mentioned, the 26 acres of um, more contemporary gardens around the museum itself. Uh, we have a 26 acre historic estate, um, including the original estate building um, built in the early 1900s. Um, as well as our Lord and Bur Burnham glass houses um, that are on the estate within the glass houses. We have our beer garden, which is very popular uh, with our guests. Um, we have that 100 acre large scale art nature park. That's really wonderful. Um, and then we do four major seasonal exhibitions every year. So we have a big spring blooms exhibition. Uh, we do a very large summer annual exhibition every year. We do harvest, which is mostly sort of coasting on our summer annuals being big and blousy and beautiful um, in the early fall with the addition of lots of slushes, gourds, and pumpkins, um, which then bleeds into a nighttime pumpkin extravaganza experience. Um, and the horticulture crew is also in charge of putting on our winter lights experience every year. So we're very busy, lots to do, um, and a very large campus in which to do it. Um, so in terms of our plant records program, I am the only plant records person in our department. Um, I am also the first plant records person at our institution in its tenure. Um, so I am sort of making up from many, many years of lost time. Um, we have been Iris BG users since early 2020. We got the license at the very, very tail end of 2019. Um, and we have four concurrent user licenses. Um, our horticulturists don't use the system very much. Um, we have a separated ordering system and database system. So oftentimes um, they will do some quick lookups if they need to, but I'm typically available to help them find whatever information they need. Um, we use Iris BG in conjunction with ArcGIS for our field work and plant mapping, um, but perfecting that workflow uh, is another coffee chat for another time. Um, I'm still sort of working on adapting the past ways of doing things um, and sort of evolving them and modernizing them into appropriate current um, best practices for plant record systems. Um, we have what I would call a, a medium collection. So we have just over 6,000 living accessions um, and that encompasses almost 3,500 living taxa. Um, we do not accession our seasonal display plants. Uh, but we do keep records of their taxonomy. So for all of our spring and summer annuals, what I will do is I will um, check all of the nomenclature for our labels and whatnot, but we do not accession those orders. That would just be too much paperwork for me to handle in any given season. Um, so how and why do we use costume attributes? They help me keep my data organized for easy to pull lists on the information that I need most and most frequently. Um, it helps me sort of quickly categorize things. Um, and not only does it help with the categorizations to pull lists, but it's also a really great sort of instant visual cue when I'm looking in records in the system. Um, you can find all of that information elsewhere in the records, um, but it just creates sort of a no dig highlight um, that tells me that this record is important for some reason. Um, so for right now, uh, Newfields is under an insane amount of construction in our garden. We're doing garden renovations, back of house renovations. Um, we have three construction projects going on now with one that's about to start again and one about to start next year. So we are doing a lot of plant purchasing, um, a lot of plant moving, so a lot of important records moments. So uh, construction projects is one that I use a ton um, to categorize and use in custom attributes. Um, we also use seasonal planting and we use it to track the nativity of our taxa. Um, so this is just sort of a quick 
screenshot of uh, the custom attributes definitions in Iris. Um, so you can see I have it set up as um, our accessions. We use the uh, project code list um, because that is primarily what I'm doing when I'm tracking accessions. I'm tracking is this accession part of a construction project or part of a bigger sort of category that I need to track it in. Um, and then for the taxon modules, um, we also use the project, um, the project code list, but we also track nativity there. Um, so you can see this is where the code list are. So for nativity, we have um, Indiana native plants in their cultivars, uh, plants that are US natives that are not Indiana natives, um, similarly plants that are North American native, but not Indiana natives. Um, and then we also track plants that have um, either proven to be invasive or escaped from captivity in North America. And then for projects, you can see I have the long list of projects um, from construction projects um, to you know, our various plant walk projects, um, as well as our seasonal display titles. Um, so how I use those designations, um, this is an example of one of our Magnolia records um, from the Border Garden Construction Project that we're working on now. Um, and so, you know, I can use the, the purpose under the details um, obviously, you know, using a combination of the accession year and the item location would also tell me that it was probably part of the border garden construction project, but it's so convenient to just add this attribute in um, and then it's just very, very obvious that this accession was purchased for this project um, and it makes the list easier to pull, which I'll show in a second. Similarly, uh, when we're talking in the taxa module, um, I use the attributes in a very similar way. So as I'm checking nomenclature, as I'm accessioning, um, if it's something that I'm doing specifically for a construction project or a seasonal display, um, then I will go ahead and use that project code. Um, and then in taxa is where I really use that nativity. Um, so sort of tracking the level of nativeness. Um, so specifically our institution is very interested in Indiana natives, of course, um, but depending on the data that the administration may want at any given point in time, it's also very helpful for me to track the other levels as well. Um, so I um, will show you, I, I find it very, very easy to use the attribute accession, the attribute, cut some attributes in the reports. Um, I find it a lot easier than having to go through and either make a lot of selections or go through and create an event. Um, it makes it very easy for me to say, I want to do some mapping in of the new plants in the new border garden construction. All I have to do is open up the attribute accession, um, select the project and make it equal to the border garden construction. And then it pulls me all of the accessions that have that tag. Um, so that is really nice and really simple. Um, and then similarly, I could refine that even further. I could want all of the border garden construction accessions. So all those plants we purchased for this project uh, but say I want to do a presentation on only the ones that are native to Indiana, I can then specify that even further. Um, so it just, it makes it incredibly easy to pull. Um, there's relatively little data cleanup. Uh, where I run into needing a little bit of cleanup is uh, if I have multiple items within an accession that has been tagged for a project. Um, but it's, it's very, very you. Um, and if anything, it sort of helps me track, you know, did we get that um, for the project and did everything end up for another purpose or did it get split up? It sort of helps me follow along with the plants um, as we go along. So when I originally set this up, I sort of goobered up. I am always, you know, have multiple plate spinning and, you know, I'm just trying to get stuff done really quick while I have 20 minutes to sit down at my computer. Um, so when I originally did this, I didn't even think of creating custom code lists. 
um, for my various projects and nativities. Um, so I sort of just flipped through the code list and I was like, okay, themes, like, yeah, sure, I'll use themes, that's fine. Turns out that isn't really the way that it's designed to be used. Um, so Mari was very kind and sort of nudged me in the right direction and said, hey, you know, you can create custom code lists. Um, so that's what I did. And then they came to my rescue and created a super, super simple little script. Well, the script wasn't necessarily simple. It was simple for me to use and implement um, where all I had to do was run the script and it flipped all of my custom attributes from the tables that it was pulling from the theme and flipped it into those new um, project code lists, the custom code list for me. Um, so it took all of five minutes for me to fix on my end, I appreciated sort of the help and the assist. Um, and yeah, um, I think I have a question from, let's see, John Green. And it says, um, have you discussed the pros and cons of using the project field uh, versus creating a custom attribute for projects? Um, I find that the custom attributes stand out a little bit more visually to me. And it's also a, super duper one-stop shop for the reporting from my end. Um, I would love to hear if somebody is using the project field. Um, I'd love to hear that in the chat later. Um, and then let's see, there are a couple of other questions. Um, so Linda asked where I add a new target, um, the first selection for the new column and the attributes. So that is those custom code lists. Um, do you change or add to purpose for projects because plants move? I don't necessarily do that um, for the most part. That will be part of my data cleanup on the back end. Um, if an entire accession was originally purchased for a project and ends up absolutely not being used for that project, um, then I might consider it, but I haven't really run into that as an issue very much. Um, and let's see, question from Christopher. We record project plantings as a task. What advantages, disadvantages are there to using custom attributes compared to a task? Um, with custom attributes, I just found it a little bit easier to have very broad overarching categories that can intermingle. Um, it sort of helps me very, very quickly in the report field um add sort of those layers like with the example of wanting the border garden accession plants um as well as wanting them to specifically only be indiana native um so those are sort of the answers to my questions for now um we can answer more and discuss more after we uh send it on to allison hi everyone and thank you jamie for the great introduction my slides don't exist, so they can't even compare to your wonderful slides. I'm um, Marie got in co contact with me and said, would you like to say something towards the end of last week? And I simply haven't had time to repair, prepare, but I said I'd share my screen because at the National Trust, we use custom attributes for a lot of things. And basically, I'm going to walk through what we have and what we do. Um, so a bit of background about the National Trust, if I um, share this screen now. I just pulled up a map on this screen of all of the gardens that we have in the National Trust in the United Kingdom. So in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, we're a bit obviously different to Jamie. So a lot of the way that we use our custom attributes are to manage our workflow because we have so many gardens. Very similar to Jamie though, we are uh, suffering from a lack of resource. So um, whereas you have one person doing plant records for one garden, I'm the only official person doing records for 180 or maybe 200 gardens, but 180 with staff. Um, and uh, I have one other wonderful person who helps me with the taxonomy, choosing the, the correct names. And then most of the time, what we're reliant on is our gardeners, trying to do plant records off the side of their desks and volunteers, lots and lots of wonderful, very engaged volunteers, um, often from very different backgrounds. We have ex Formula One engineers, ex chemical engineers. I don't know quite why engineers seem to love plant records and they, and they get very heavily involved. Um, so we have 
lots and lots of famous gardens, Sissinghurst, Hidcote, Bodnant, Nyman's, um, and then we have a lot of properties that might have just some very famous individual plants like Isaac Newton's apple tree or um, the Anchorwick yew, which is where the Magna Carta was signed, one of our very important historic documents. So I'm just going to flip now um, Iris BG up and you can see on the right hand side in the attributes, hopefully is that big enough for everybody or is that too small? Marie, is that large enough for people to see? It's large enough for me at least. I can't see anyone objecting. Yep, looks good. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll pull it. I'll pull it wider. Um, so, all I've done here is press the star button to pull up all of the attributes that we use in the National Trust at the moment. Some of these are more frequently used than others. Um, but I'm just going to go through them and talk through what they are and, and why we use them uh, and open up some of the drop downs so you can see some of the substance behind them. And hopefully that will at least prompt some thoughts about how it might be useful uh, for, for some of you in your in particular environments. You can see one of the first things I've done is given things numbers because otherwise attributes organize themselves alphabetically and so I have artificially grouped them if you will into sections depending on their purpose um, so that was a useful thing that I discovered um, after I started creating quite a few of them was that actually giving them some sort of numeric starting point was was useful when there were so many of them the very first one that comes along the top is just a simple text field for new information so Back before we moved to Irish BG, our previous system, anybody in the country could make up their own plant name. We discovered that this was a really, really bad idea when I took over and um, we've got all sorts of names from um, Tony One to um, Unknown Unknown uh, and decided to lock down the tax list. And so only a, two of us can make changes to the tax list. So now in Taxa, we have a taxa called new, if this will come up for me. And it says add details to attribute. So now someone doesn't get stuck because they can't get in contact with me to make a new taxa record. Um, instead, they can ask me for what they want and they can type in their name here. And this means I can now run global reports across all properties using the new info attribute, which tells me I want you know, this new cultivar name, we can validate it to check that they've chosen the correct one and it's not a synonym, et cetera, et cetera, and add it to the list so that they can use it. Um, other things that we, the reason it's not called new taxa, it's new info, is we also use it for people wanting new contacts. They've been to another nursery or um, another uh, garden to acquire new materials. So we put new uh, contacts in there and similarly I have a new contact option on the left hand side she says I think yep new contact and it says add details to attribute new info and similarly again for wild source plants if somebody would like a new locality so that we can lock down some of those drop down lists um, to prevent chaos or too much chaos. Um, so that's our first one. And I gave that a dash at the start just to make sure that it appeared at the top because that's the one that most people are likely to use out there. Um, and it also helps us visually, the numbers help us visually see everything in the same order when we come to look at records so that we our eyes know what we're, we're looking for. The next section beginning with one are about the significance of our plants, why we keep our records in the first place. So we have, a, we're a, a charitable organization, we have a limited number of resource, um, and we have a, a limited ability to keep great plant records. Um, we have to be very clear why we're keeping them. 
Um, we can't always keep a record of everything much as um, we'd like to. Um, so we have developed a concept called significance. So what is the significance of this plant? Can we tell a story about that plant? And we've grouped significance, that's what the SIG stands for, um, doesn't fit in as a, as a full word, into five big categories. We've got history and culture, landscape and spirit of place, spirit of place being the UNESCO um, definition for um, world heritage sites, the thing that is unique about your garden, um, significant for horticulture, significant for wild plant reasons because it's been sourced from from the wild and significant for nature and each one of these then divides into multiple other categories so we have for history and culture we could have a plant that has been planted by a famous figure or related to a significant event so that would be something like Isaac Newton's apple tree or the Tolpodl Martyr's uh, tree which is a, a sycamore where um, a group of um, activists met long, long time ago, or Anchorwick U, which was where the Magna Carta was signed. So things that were significant historically. Um, other options, original introductions. So plants that we have in our gardens that were collected in the wild by Kingdom Ward, George Forrest, um, Reginald Farrer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, early introduction means collected by one of these people probably, but old enough to be but we don't know we don't have the records or it's an original cultivar this was the very first plant that was used as a large breeding program which we have a few of significant in the landscape or spirit of place we have plants closely associated with the property or planted by a local figure and then a whole heap of things we have in the uk um, around champion trees uh, which are trees that have the tallest or the, the widest uh, trunk girth um, or other, are otherwise remarkable. And so we have various categories for those. Ideally, we'd almost like two layers of custom attributes. Um, if you can see there's some categories going on in here within these custom attributes. So it would almost be great to be able to kind of group champion tree Britain and Ireland and then have a sub custom attribute for girth height or otherwise remarkable but these are you know we i've listed them all um individually at the moment uh under horticulture we have plants that are part of a recognized thematic systematic or historic plant collection plants that are generally rare cultivars or species that are rare in cultivation um plants named after the property is it uh Lavender hicca, for example, or um, differs from a typical form or an exceptional form of a plant. Under wild plant, do we know where it, exactly where it came from? Do we have the collector's notes and we know exactly where it came from? And therefore, although we are not botanic gardens, can it be put to scientific use if it was part of a broader meta collection of plants? Um, is it part of a recognised ex situ conservation programme? We don't do any in situ conservation ourselves, but um, we are part of some international ex situ conservation programmes. And is it a species of conservation concern? So is it on the IUCN red list? And then significant for nature, we often have ancient or veteran trees in our gardens. Um, or notable trees that are the next generation of veterans. So they are supporting wildlife in general. And then if it is a champion tree, the organization that looks after the champion trees in the UK normally issue an ID. So this is a random UK thing um, where I find a custom attribute is useful to store a particular type of number in the same way that um, Jamie is recording, you know, specific things about your local environment and, and nativity to your local environment. Number two is story. Sometimes people write a couple of paragraphs on the story behind a tree. So we find that that's kind of useful to put there. It doesn't get tied into the record, but it might in future get picked up by some other app or something to tell the story in the future. Um, is there an issue with the record? That's kind of a useful to make notes. What am I missing? We're not sure about the nursery. There's two with the same name. Is it this, is it this one or that one? Um, sorry, I've jumped around. Is, so 
um, we're missing the collection notes, but we're waiting for them. Something that I can then run a report on that will trigger future work to make sure that we go back and remember and clean up that record because there's some problem with it. The next set on the list are, have we done some Phytophthora testing? Now, I haven't actually found that I've got this to work yet. So I've put them in there and I'd be interested if anybody else is recording plant health issues to this level of detail and is getting them to work. I find that what I actually want with my plant health information is for that to be available in a mobile form. Um, so at the moment, custom attributes don't transfer through to the mobile app that we use. Um, so that I've, I've put that in, but I think I may end up taking that out because it's not in, in great use at the moment. And ditto, I'm gonna skip through section five and get on to section six, because section six is one of the things that we use quite a lot. And this again, may be very unique to the trust, but it, I can see how it might translate in larger gardens where you have lots and lots of people asking for material all the time. So we are kind of using the system as a customer relationship management system, in that it is managing orders for plants. We have a plant conservation center, um, which propagates all of our rare and unusual uh, plants for redistribution through our properties. So for succession planning at particular gardens or to pass on to other gardens, um, and our countryside as well. We're doing rare think, species that are rare in the wild. So having said, we don't do in situ conservation. We do in our conservation. So we, we propagate black poplars, um, juniper, um, wild asparagus, all sorts of odd things for our native, our local native conservation. And we have a whole section, you can see 6.1 to 6.15, that helps us manage these. And not only do we have these attributes, but we create them on accessions with a 9999 year. So we are literally using Iris BG to create orders. So that order will not be a real plant. It won't have an item. It just has the details page filled in with 9999 as the starting year. And then we start filling in all the details about what the customer wants and why and how many they've ordered and how many we've got growing. Um, so our customer, these are some of our gardens. These are all of our gardens that we have grown plants for. And then in our order contact, we'll write the name of the person who's asked for it. Then we define the type, what type of request is it? And you can see here, we've got this word significant coming up again. So is it a significant plant? Is it significant, but it's our, that's our countryside term. Is it significant, but we can't propagate it at the plant conservation center because the material is diseased. So we need to prop it on site. Is it something that's simply difficult to source? Um, the plant conservation center has been peat free for 30 years. So, um, and the National Trust has been peat free for, uh, I don't know quite how long, but uh, at least possibly two decades now. And obviously there's challenges with going peat free. Um, and one of those is that you can't always find the plants that you want um, from, from nurseries uh, because they are still sadly grown in peat in many places. So that could be a, a difficult to source plant that we are growing simply because otherwise we can't find it peat free. And I should say that, you know, in 30 years, we've grown an awful lot of rhododendrons and other, other plants that like ericaceous uh, soil. So it is completely and utterly possible. Please do it, um, make the switch. Then we've got um, external conservation. So we do propagation for other organizations within the, within the UK. Um, and we do some private work for donations to the charity. And we do a, a bit of work for uh, selling to our customers, our members, but not, not much. We're not set up for large scale work. We're set up for tiny, tiny amounts of propagation of really complicated things. Um, and then we have rootstocks. And you can see it's always a work in progress. There's some things here that say to be deleted. Um, and that's, you know, data cleanup. I put them in, they didn't quite work, but I've got some data in there. So I need to clear the data out before I can get rid of them. 
I've got a reason, so I can write a long reason. I've got, <laughs> how's the parent? Is it dead? Is it still alive? You know, how urgent is this propagation? Has it just fallen over? Um, how are we doing? Is the order open? Is it cancelled? Is it complete? When was it asked for? When did we last? This is a date field, another date field when we last confirmed it. How many did they ask for? They asked for 10 originally, now they want 20. We've got five alive. We've got 40 in propagation. Um, we don't therefore need to propagate it again. Pending need is propagate it again. And we've already delivered two because obviously plants don't all grow at the same pace. <laughs> so we then have a sort of notes field for order admin. Now I should say with this, what I then do is I run reports. I pull it out of here, throw it into an access database, manipulate it, count up because I'm using a same reference now. So I could have multiple accessions fulfilling this one order. I then manipulate that within the, the access database, total up how many things are alive, how many things are in propagation, how many we've delivered, and throw it back in again. So it takes a bit of extra manipulation that might not be everybody's cup of tea, but we're using this all the time, day in, day out, new orders are going on there, orders are being updated. Um, we hold plants because of for stock reasons that we don't want to get rid of, that we keep in the nursery. So I then have section seven is all about why we are keeping stock plants and you can see again i've got one that says delete because i need to do some cleanup um, and who the who wants the stock plant so like we have anchorwick we're keeping the anchorwick u um, and and why why we're keeping it and how long we're going to keep a stock plant for um, then i've used an attribute for a national trust collection so this is something that is national wide so it could be a uh, plants in garden in 180 gardens could make up a collection and obviously the way that IHBG thinks it's thinking co one collection at a time so I'm looking at using attributes to manage reports where I have um, plants in multiple gardens but I want to join them together in one project, if you will, or, or one task list. And I think custom attributes would work for that. And then I have another one, which is just where I can throw notes from our old system that then need cleaning up. So there's a huge different range of reasons why I'm using it. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully some of that was useful. That's going to stop sharing. Uh, Alison, before you stop sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you. That was amazing. And I think many people are taking notes now and being inspired by how you use this very comprehensive list. So I got one question uh, where they ask you if you can show an example uh, of a real example where you where you're using this. Um, so I'm in I'm in the plant conservation center at the moment. Um, so I'm gonna search on, all the accessions with 999 at the start. So these are all of our orders. Um, so well, when have I got 2,851 orders. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see I've I've changed my view here so that received reference for me is actually my order number that I referenced. So my order number is BD, BIDD in this instance for uh, Bidolf, and it's number one because it's succession number one. So basically, I'm changing my reference number into the I'm using the accession number and a code that represents the property. Um, Duchy is our microprop unit. Um, so you can see these are all changing. This is our wild asparagus for the Gower. Um, here's Hidcut, lots of rhododendrons done for Hidcut and some strange things. Um, here's one of the orders. And you can see they originally asked for six. Um, and we delivered 15 of them and that's completed. And that was 
uh, a particular flocks that they were known for. Um, if I go back to the list, I could go to, going to go to Fitzroy. -a. You see, we did a lot of cider apples there. I go to Fitzroy, -a. you see there are lots of wild source Fitzroy -a because we're part of the International Conifer Conservation Program. And these we propagated for RBG Edinburgh. Uh, and a lot of those went over to Dublin, um, to Glasnevin. And we've propagated those for Martin Gardner at RBGE. Um, and we delivered 11 eventually. And then if I searched on this number here, in the rec ref, I can pull up not only the order, but in this case, there's only one accession that fulfills that order. You see, it has the same reference. So here is my record for the plants that we grew, the plants that were delivered, and they are all in an exchange and they went to Glasnevin. So thank you everyone for participating today and a special thanks to Jamie, of course, uh, also for helping me to moderate this uh, chat and also for Alison to showing the tremendous work you've been doing on your collection. I think, yeah, I, after seeing that th there's no excuse for anyone else to not doing anything with the custom attributes, I think. Um, Good luck with it. <laughs> Don't bite off more than you can chew. So great. See you in, in November, hopefully. All right. Bye, y'all. Thank you so much.